that. We're saying by how well we respond before. And so even some Lutherans, I happen to call in them several months ago, uh, Lutheran and ELCA in a very high position. And strangely enough, he's even in charge of one of the social ministries of the ELCA. He wrote an essay that he was tired of hearing about Matthew 25. Oh my heart. He was tired of hearing about Matthew 25 because it was making Lutheranism sound like it's not about grace, it's about good works. And as long as you have that dichotomy, then uh, if, you, if you say that the requirement is that you demonstrate that to some peers, it will sound like you fall in law. So uh, we, I'm not going to solve that today, but you might keep it in the back of your mind. Right? So if somebody here today that announced it was a boy, uh, my mother often accused my father of more structure. <laughs> <laughs> And my mother would be sitting there on the table and she would listen to my dad talking about maybe something that he thought the church should be doing. You know, that's what the Christian is doing. And my mother would say, Bill, I think I hear some more righteousness there. Uh, it sounds like you're saying if you're not doing that, you're not a real Christian, but you know. It only takes grace to make a real Christian. And Christ died for our sins, and it's all free after that. So uh, get on, get on board, Bill. Otherwise, I don't know how you can still be keeping some sort of sin. So Lutherans can get into that, and probably every Christian denomination can become obsessed or meticulous. About certain things that should or should not be taught. Uh, the uh, right above the, the, the middle of your first page there on the second, that in the church gathered, that's us here gathered, in the church gathered, there are things that you can do. To uh, make this uh, sink into us as something that's really important. So we can preach different sermons that would periodically address this question. Uh, there could be teaching classes, there could be confirmation, there could be a public forum. And of course, there could be social ministry, of which this church has an abundance. So even a simple thing, always oh, sounds slightly hokey to me, but it's backpacks for children. So people come together and they fill backpacks with important things. And then they give them away to kids who maybe are going to school that are sort of poor, not that much. But uh, it's kind of a gift from the group. So, that sounds like good things to be doing. Now the question is that I'm jumping to now, we're now opening on the first half, page one. How did this get going? And um, because the people who don't want this to come true, they don't want Christianity to have anything to do with social justice. They're saying this is just this is important for my church. It had nothing to do with the history of the church. And so in the book that I have written, which is coming out in fall, I think, I say that if you look down through the history of Christianity, you can see how a couple of people, like Luther, for instance, you can see how more the person who founded Western monasticism. You can, you can see how people see something 
And as we say, they are completely. They say, wow, that verse in the Bible, which I had not noticed before, is speaking to me, is grabbing me. And I think it's not the right for me. Uh, this is the way Luther read Paul. Well, Luther had this moment too. It wasn't Matthew 25, it was Galatians and Romans. And Luther, who had this tremendous honors, he's this monk writing his lectures and preaching his sermons, pulled up in this monastery. And, and he can't seem to be, he convinced himself that God really loves him or that he's meeting God's standards. And he's struggling with the Bible. And one day, it, we call it his power experience, his tool experience. One day, Luther's, the light goes off, and Luther hears Paul speaking directly to him and grabs him and won't let him go. And the price of revelation starts. So, I mean, this could, this could actually happen. And that's that. It happened when the Nazis movement started. It happened when the Salvation Army started after John Wesley, you know, seven, two centuries later. And uh, we turned the world upside down. Uh, if the non people we come to think to, then this is God speaking to you. And so you could write a, a book about new religious movements in which a couple people or a group are seized by a biblical message, it turns their life around and they start a new movement of a new movement. And pretty soon the world starts to change. New religious movement comes naturally to me. When I was a graduate student at Berkeley, the uh, sociology faculty is the Berkeley guy, a big word foundation grant. Because somebody thought there was something to put in the Bay Area in those days. And uh, so they asked six people, six graduate students, if they wanted to participate in that. And it also promised that you would get a little money to help you with your research expenses. And I volunteered to do the Jesus movement in Berkeley. And uh, the Jesus movement was founded by a couple of people from an extremely conservative evangelical movement called Camp Crusade for Christ, which these days would be from Q is called the CR like it used to be Camp Crusade for Christ. And they were the most conservative of all the evangelical. Christian movements. So you wouldn't have expected that they were going to be down on the beach or picketing next to That's good what I was working with. Or trying to do things, introducing guitars into, into worship or changing the way uh, worship could happen. I remember once there was a, a communion service. So I was doing what's called participant observation. So the observer joins the group, but people know that he's just an you know, outsider. He's busy, but he's busy in Tennessee. And I remember one time there was a communion service in this home in Berkeley. And somebody for whom this was the thing to do took the bread and tossed it in the air through the group because he thought that would be a cool way to show a cool. Now, to a Lutheran, a high church Lutheran, it, it, it was uh, profoundly offensive. But those people thought they were bringing worship down to the level of street people, people who lived on the beach, people who were coming into the cities looking for me. So, there are all kinds of ways that the new Jewish group. Um, the Gilded Age, you might have seen uh, a television series on 
there was a late nineteenth century when uh, Patrick Bills and more people were immensely wealthy. Railroads and the standard oil and everything else. And everybody thought they were just the most amazing thing. And the country bowed down and said, Boy, look at all the companies, New Yorkers, and we build ever better houses and so forth. And meanwhile, poor people were not really being, were being stopped at and screwed and terrible wages. Six or seven hour work weeks, and children who couldn't get to school. And so, uh, by the turn of the century, around the 1910 20, uh, liberal Protestants, they weren't Lutherans, so they weren't Baptists, liberal Protestants invented for that period a social gospel. And the argument of the social gospel is if you take the things that you're reading in the New Testament, such as Matthew 35, or in the Old Testament, uh, such as God's obsession with how the poor are doing, with how widows and orphans and immigrants, and that is a running joke about Old Testament scholars, the Holy Trinity in the Old Testament, not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but widows, orphans, and immigrants. Now, those of those people are not high on the list today, right? Immigrants, widows, and orphans. So there was this obsession with how these people do it. And these, uh, these liberal Protestants went into public schools the way maybe we were accustomed to people do today. Now and then, the EPA people are checking to see what poor people are, what poor kids are, sort of falling behind. And, and so uh, they looked at them, they looked at housing, at health care, at this and that, and they called it the social gospel. You can call it whatever you want to do. They call it the social gospel. And it became famous. If you read a book about it today, it will say in the 1920s, the greatest contribution of American liberal Christianity was the social gospel and the faith of the world. And it became famous throughout the world. Now, besides that, however, and that's really an overstatement, but that's the only truth here when we're talking about Protestants. Catholicism in Europe, not the United States, Catholicism in Europe was trying to decide how you could help people who are being ground down by the So the miracle of uh, capitalism and its tremendous ability to produce goods was not good for most workers. And so Catholicism came up with this genius, which is not going to surpass that, and so it's not by Lutherans either, this ingenious way of responding to the of the Industrial Revolution. One thing they did was, it's called the Worker Peace Movement. They went out and they looked around their parishes and they said, who are some people in this parish who are clearly working class people? But they also seem to have potential and they seem kind of smart. Let's send them to seminary because when they go to seminary, they will bring their working class and their poverty and the suffering they had at the hands of the unjust society, they'll bring that with them. And when they graduate from seminary and go back into congregations, uh, they'll, they'll still be bothered by that. You know, they won't be wearing fancy suits and stuff. They'll still be carrying the legacy of the working class if they go into seminary and back out. It was uh, an amazing thing, it was more of a priest movement. And another thing they did was they recovered the idea that poor people, maybe poor people especially, are made in the ancient God. Because as they looked around, it seemed like everybody believed in the ancient God. But what they didn't know was 
rich people or they had lots of stuff to show everyone. So you can see that they had the uh, and so the 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 uh, top of the said, God, what about poor people? Right? They made an image of God. And then they did something that would scandalize Christians to this day, especially the South in the United States, they baptized the Jews. They baptized the Jews. They said the way to lift workers up and let them say, wow, uh, is to strengthen their their chances, their decision making possibilities by being in a union. And so Catholicism was much quicker than Protestantism to baptize unions, and that is true to this day. So I'm guessing if we uh, got like the South, maybe that wouldn't be so much the case for the reasons that we don't need to go into here. Uh, being pro union might happen in our country, but they don't typically have it in the South. Amazon is going to come to be the center of the land. So, so you have this, 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 this Catholic way that say, what's this obsession that's going to be cultural Marxism? It's straight out of the New Testament. It's straight out of the Old Testament. And um, so the Gilded Age uh, was uh, negated or attacked by these people who said, if you want to take the Christian message, what power does it really have if it ever, if it ever gets out onto now, let me just stop and see what you think about. Because, um, you, you know, you don't have to buy it just because I'm pushing it. Um, I probably not all the things buy it. There's a little bit too big, it's not the right word for righteousness. And there are people who think, you know, when you get involved in politics, uh, then uh, you can a record. Christian theology. Now, FDR, who was the great, uh, first great president who worked, who tried to instill and institutionalize social justice, he was an Episcopalian, and some people think that he was somewhat influenced by Christianity. And LBJ's biography said that he remembered the lessons he learned in Sunday school, and that's why uh, LBJ's Great Society sounds a little bit like Christianity, because he would be bringing out his Sunday school lessons. And this is uh, his most significant biography of some of the volumes of it. So I'm trying to think, unless I got that right. Uh, but you don't see it that much. You don't hear it that much. Uh, one way to help people, I think, and it's now become sort of cliche, is that justice is just a social form of law. And it's a lot of points to make with almost everybody's favor. Don't accept the law. Like Jesus says, you must love one another. And uh, love it. So if you want to love your neighbor, and now here's the jump. If you want to love your neighbor, which is good, if you can create a social system in which your neighbor can flourish. So that's how we get to the loss of social justice. But anybody see any problem um, with that? The, 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 where we're going to uh, in the next in 15 minutes before the class ends, we're going to get to the tricky part, and then the whole point of the fourth week and Sunday is: Do you really want to argue 
that if we're really going to be good Christians, we should be involved in political action through which we can create a more just society. Or is that exactly? It's okay to let you know. You want to be a Republican or Democrat? It's okay. Okay, fine. It has nothing to do with the church. It has nothing to do with Christianity. It has nothing to do with what Jesus saying, Do you see me among them? So, what do you think? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the point is that the Christianity of the gospel was a reverse of our worship. It's still progress in some way. And the part of the church was the state religion that was suffering. Would you take your last thought because I'm not, maybe, maybe other people have done that, but I think, did I hear the word subversive or not? Was it subversive of the revolution of the Yeah. That existed within a obscure province of Rome. And essentially, it was a transformation of the revolutionary into a state revolution, which actually was the subversion. Yeah. So, so you're saying it can easily go astray. Well, it's easy for you to find the uh, dominant culture to support the dominant culture as distinct from the. Yeah. So the, the revolutionary aspect is arising from the nature of the culture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I, at this church last two, a couple of Sundays ago, we had a woman who's running for something in Pierce County. And uh, now the church does this occasionally. And um, notice she didn't do that to be there. She wasn't saying, you know, how uh, you're too Christian for the woman. But she didn't even say, the kind of programs that I stand for um, are the kind of things you should be standing for for your Christians. And uh, I'm trying to help a poor school, poor school children and uh, this and that and so forth, and elderly people who have memory issues and so forth. I'm not trying to set up a society in which we can address all those people. And surely you must too, given what I hear you Christians stand for. What, what, what would you think? Is that you can buy that? Not that she should have said that, but if she had said it, would you have said yes? Yeah, you know, My it's almost me when you talk about the conflict of our as a separation of Christianity from an obligation to be a Christian. But I think there is a huge spectrum of discussion about how do you do it? What's the best way to help people? And in the time of the gospel, the time of the Bible, um, they didn't have programs like venture and labor and companionship and things that we created. They also didn't have capitalism, which creates jobs. So there's a huge opportunity for people to disagree or agree on what's the best way to help people. They don't officially choose it. And my hope would be that they to at least agree on the fundamental of Christ's teaching in Matthew. And even he's coming up with some, whatever it is. Yeah. And already in the 16th century, when, so the 16th century, well, well, there was pushing for the Protestant revolution or Reformation. Uh, the peasants uh, started a war in Central Germany to sort of recover our just society. They were all serfs. They were all oppressed by noble land. 
And Luther developed a concept which I think most people agree to to this day. There isn't a Christian economics. There are Christians who are looking for the best way to construct a social system that serves the most people. But there's not a, a particular Christian way of doing that. The only thing Christian is, you should be thinking about it. You should be voting about it. You should be worrying about it. And uh, if you have to be a Christian economist, then maybe you'll uh, worry about that, not get where it may take place. You can say to Christians, and I say this in what I gather is a middle class conversation here, to Christians be critics of capitalism. And there you're talking about a dangerous ground. America mostly considers itself a capitalist country, maybe even the leader of the capitalist world, though so along with Japan and most of Europe and so forth. And so uh, Christians with a social gospel, on the one hand, I didn't mind to say, we have to criticize capitalism. And what we have to do with it is to regulate it. Whereas if you are a conservative, you stand for deregulation. Reagan taught us that uh, in a famous little story about uh, and somebody knocks on the door and says, I'm here from the government to help you slam the door because government is always evil. Pretty interesting you got the credit. Uh, the government solutions are always going to be bad, and only individual level uh, movements are appropriate. And if you get people trying to regulate the market, that's always going to be bad, usually with the bad ideas or self interested ideas. Whereas, and so conservative Christian in the United States, in many cases, maybe not so much Lutherans, are likely to say that the free market is God's way of doing so. God is a capitalist. God is the master of capitalists. And, uh, and so this is sometimes called free market fundamentalism. In other words, the essence of Christianity is a free market that will go its own way without regulation, and that will produce it for everybody. Now that's we could call, and if, if, if we were in a college class, we say, well, that's an empirical question. Let's collect as much data as there is to see whether countries in which there is a completely free market, unregulated by the government, there's not even an OSHA. That, that makes you uh, have safe working conditions for your workers. There's no regulation of any kind. Uh, could you test whether, where that is the case, people do worse or better? Uh, typically in the United States, if you're liberal, you say, look at Norway and Sweden, they're so cool. Uh, he could regulate. When North Sea oil was found, this is an example often did. When North Sea oil was found in the North Sea next to Norway and it fell into Norway uh, territory that was owned by, owned by Norway, the first thing they did is put it into a national fund. They didn't have any standard oil. They put it into a national fund and spent it on the people. Free college education for everybody. Free health care for everyone. Free this for everybody. That's what they did with their North Sea oil. We never would have done it. We would have set a standard of, oh, well, you had to develop this and put it on even if you want to do Now, does that mean we have that money wrong and Norway is definitely right? Now, to frame my man, I'm saying it's an empirical question. You can say, well, let's, 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 let's see how it goes. I was teaching this master at sea once, and we were sailing um, 
out of the dark city sort of way with the lives came to the And our students were saying, Boy, I bet they all wish they were. I bet this whole country was so pretty that somehow get admitted to the United States. And the doctor said, Let me break this. They're glad we have. I think we are a primitive society compared to the social welfare, the social justice that they had built into their system. Now, I love to say that I didn't say this on board because I didn't know people. I wanted to say, and that's that's the reason. The reason the reason Scandinavia has this wonderfully beneficial society is to deeply the protein of the first time. But uh, that would be a claim that um, is beautiful. I didn't think that was funny. Uh, it could be partly true. Uh, there are some books that say that. The first thing Luther did, he gave, um, it's called the address to the German nobility, the German nation. The first thing he said was, uh, we, got, we have to create a more just system. And now brace yourself. So, just the way Nancy Pelosi's bishop in San Francisco says she can't go to the union anymore in the Catholic Church because she is pro abortion. Many early Protestants said, if you're charging a user, you can't go to the union. So that eliminates all the bankers. Can you imagine getting, getting by? Probably if we had some bankers, I don't know if it's in this church or not, but if we had bankers in this church, we might say, yeah, we have bank. And if somebody said, yeah, you know what to go to the It's a sad church. It's so bizarre. That you, you wonder what it can what it can all be, how you can be true. And in my view, the best thing to do is not act like you know too much or know more than is in fact do know or more than it is knowable. But you have to let unmistakable statements. In the Old and the New Testament, explain to you. You gotta do what they say. Um, the example I use here is you, you talk about the Bonhoeffer of Bonhoeffer. So, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a famous German Lutheran theologian who was um, put to death by the Nazis. One of all things, where he did hurt on Luther. Participated in the plot on the day of the Not a big for Luther group. But anyway, but that's not really what his family is for. He and other people said this is the moment of crisis for the country, and we have to rise up as the church and say something. And so the, a movement was called a movement was called. Confessing church, the attendant of here, the confessing church. In other words, when we look around, we can't shut up. We can't let this go by. We have to say, turning German folk into a tiny divine thing that we worship instead of God, that's wrong. That's going to be the end of Christianity. And another, and, and the pastors, some pastors develop the so called pastors' emergency plea. Father wrote one. And uh, a, a number of pastors said this is a national emergency. If we don't respond to this, when the war is over, people are going to say, Where were you, Lutherans? Did this just get by you? You didn't notice? And then a similar example would be the Dutch Calvinism uh, that ruled South Africa when apartheid finally became impossible to control. And a sprinkling of very wealthy white colonizers ruled the country and 
black people were in the house. And finally, the Dutch child ministers woke up and said, this is a crucial moment. We can't let this go by. What will people say if a apartheid goes deeper and deeper and nobody says, and it is a way this is South Africa Christian country. So how did that happen? You guys have noticed. You're going to have to take a stand. You're going to have to have a revolution. And he did. And the most famous people to come out of that revolution were um, Protestant clergy who led the movement. And uh, revolutionary society, okay, there's other ways to go, but they're completely different from what they used to be. And so those would be examples, not that we know what exactly the right answer is. In fact, I'll argue next week is that's why we should have conversations with people in universities or who are economists or, or bankers or whoever, because we can't know everything. We only know Christ is in our hearts. The Bible says you must be in favor of the poor and not neglect it because they are God's favorite people. And Jesus said, when you look at these people, you see me there. If you don't see me there, I wrote my book that each year when I do my income taxes, people have to kind of say, okay, you pay through the income tax book. And every couple of pages, there'll be a picture of somebody, somebody who's gone missing. Have you seen this child? Have you seen this person? They've been missing for several years, and we're just putting that picture like a little gallery of uh, people who life has been terrible. And if you have to see these people, you know, call us up, and maybe we can rescue them and invite us to us up. And that's the kind of thing Jesus might have said. And I say, when you go to the post office and they have pictures of, uh, I'm not going to say for those in this case, but desperately poor or unjustly <coughs> uh, incarcerated and so forth, uh, look closely. I think I see Jesus as one of the pictures. See, that, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. I mean, you have to say it in that clear, uh, understandable language. Wait a minute, I'm looking at this picture of all these immigrants on the Mexican border. I can't get this out of my mind, but it looks like one of them is Jesus. And then you would say, yeah, no, that's what Matthew 25 says, which you expect to see. If you see a Rose Gallery of 100 desperately poor people who buy this pretty badly, look around to see if Jesus is among them. Because you should be seeing him. And you can't say a meeting with the guy named Sir that Jesus would be in this group of the gallery of 100 people. Well, then you know what would be best for Because the Jesus, then the setting of Matthew 25 is uh, Jesus walking triumphantly. That's what we're going to expect to about. Jesus is walking triumphantly towards the cross. And on the cross, with the beauty of the resurrection in three more days, Jesus becomes king of the world. So this king of the world on the cross is the same as the king of the world in jail or in Dubai uh, or waiting outside the hospital. Is it, 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 it one of the same? Let me see what you start. What are you doing? He's getting it's too much. Uh, do you see any flaws in this? You don't agree with Do you see any flaws in this? Like, wait a minute. It just seems like we're trying to prove something theologically. And I don't think we can prove it theologically unless the couple of pastors speak a couple of weeks ago that that would be very simple. It's very lucrative. And they were talking about the theology of glory, which most of us attribute to life, so that resurrection life, rather than a theology of the cross. Uh, and they were saying, you're not 
kind of gets the theology of the Lord and how you live the theology. So it's one argument theologically, at least move in the progression of a, a social gospel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, 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 that's a very good for the Missouri City to make that straight. Um, after all these years, the, the, the idea is the theology of glory is look, aren't we all really trying to make it upper middle class, if possible, wealthy? And isn't that really the point of the human life to get there? That's the theology of the Lord. And Luther said, maybe Luther doesn't do that. That's not the suggestion stuff. And the question says that God makes his triumphant reconciliation with the world through the lonely suffering of death. I don't think I have any more because I read it recently, and this was just kind of completely factual, but the uh, very well known verse I in the uh, Jesus said, I'm the truth of life, and I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and I'll come to the Father by me, which we kind of all know what it means. If you don't believe that I hold the set of things, you won't get to heaven someday. And this person was arguing that Jesus was saying, I have come down to you and modeled how you should live. And if you are able to follow my model, then you will experience the life that I have vision for you to live. While you're yeah. That just opens that verse for me to, and, and then everything we're talking about today, you know, I, I don't want a church that tells me I shouldn't worry about. I don't want them to say this is Christian economics, you must believe us. Um, but it's all a response. Oh, I'm supposed to model my life from what Jesus said. Therefore, I'm going to gather with these people in my church or my friends or I'm going to go to or I'm going to try and encourage my family to do these things that will help create a society closer to what Jesus said. So when you say, let's say you hear, you, you hear a fire breathing sermon about how we need to change the world, but the sermon is being preached to very conservative Protestants, there you know what I say. There I say the United States are going to be We're heaven about. We're heaven about. The earth, we are already in the process of leaving behind us. And where is the Israelites living? The Christ who rules the universe does it here. So we, we need to sort of figure that out. Okay, next. So some things to see all of you. So we'll uh, sort of finish this up and maybe get into some big arguments. Until we have some food after that. Next time.